at the brutal sea battle of Svalda in the year 1000, most of Norway came under the control of the Danish king Swain Forkbeard. The battle was the latest confrontation in a near centuries long struggle by Danish rulers to exert their authority to the north. Swain's one time ally, Olaf Tryggvason, a warlord who had once ridden side by side with Swain as they ravaged England together during the 990s, made a last stand upon his mighty flagship, the Long Serpent, before leaping to his death in the frigid waters of the Baltic Sea. After consolidating his hold over Norway and dividing it up between ambitious regional jarls, Svein then turned again to England, finally conquering it in 1013. Just months later, however, the great Danish ruler died, and in the absence of his strong-handed rule, his empire began to break apart. Denmark fell into the hands of his son Harald, in England, his son Canute attempted to stake his own claim on the English throne, but was initially rejected in favour of the return of King Ethelred from his exile in Normandy. Meanwhile, in Norway, talk of rebellion against the Danes began to take hold as various vassals again attempted to reassert their independence. It is therefore not so surprising that in the aftermath of Svein's death, considerable amounts of Norwegians seem to have fought on the behalf of Canute's enemies in England and elsewhere. Apparently foremost amongst these warriors was a young mercenary commander, originally from the traditional royal heartland of Stiklestad, just 19 or so at the time, yet already a veteran battlefield commander. Olaf Haraldsson was a direct descendant of the first king of Norway, Harald Fairhair, and he likely saw it as his calling to shake off Danish control from the south and to unify Norway once more into a single kingdom. The first step in this mission was to be as much of a thorn in the side of Canute as possible, and to ensure that he wouldn't have an easy ride in conquering England and re-establishing Danish control in Norway. This opportunity first arose when Ethelred, an exile in Normandy at the court of his brother-in-law at the time, was recalled back to assume his throne by the Witten of England. Olaf, also in Normandy, went with him. Though little is concretely known about Olaf's youth, it seems that as a potential claimant to the throne of Norway during a time when ambitious regional jarls ruled most of the country on behalf of the Danish king, he probably hadn't been welcome nor particularly safe in his homeland. As he was canonised shortly after his death because of his adherence to Christianity, a vast amount of information was later written on Olaf. Yet precisely because of these legends, it remains difficult to arrive at an accurate picture of his life. As was often the case with royal princes in Scandinavia, Olaf seems to have taken to the seas early in his life to make a name for himself. According to one of the most important sources of his life, the Heimskringla, written down in around 1225, Olaf landed on the Estonian island of Saramea in 1008 at the head of a band of warriors. At first, the local inhabitants agreed to pay off the Vikings to leave, though soon enough, a force was raised to fight them. A hard battle was fought there on the shores of the Baltic Sea, but Olaf and his men eventually emerged victorious. If the sagas are to be believed, he then led his men even further north to the coast of modern-day Finland. At the Battle of Herdala, fought within the mysterious frosted woodlands of the north, Olaf was ambushed and barely escaped with his life back to his ships, losing a large number of men in the process. Despite a heavy storm arising, Olaf then ordered his ships to cast off and only barely survived to tell the tale. After more raiding and adventuring around the shores of the Baltic, Olaf eventually found his way to Normandy, originally founded by Scandinavians a century earlier, but now a Christian duchy, officially subject to France, yet in reality mostly independent from outside influence. Despite being Christians now, the Normans still looked fondly upon their past and tended to have a soft spot for Scandinavians, who often found service in the armies of the Norman dukes. Thus, when Ethelred, then married to Emma of Normandy, the sister of the Duke of Normandy, was recalled to the throne of war-torn England in 1014, Olaf not only went with him, but could have actually been the very reason why Ethelred was able to gain entrance into London and reclaim his throne. According to some sources, Olaf led his Norse warriors into battle against Canute's Danes, possibly even leading a seaborne attack which pulled down London Bridge. Though he had reclaimed his throne, Ethelred soon became ill and support for him fell away as Canute returned to England again with a large army. Sensing that the time was now right to return to Norway, 
and possibly even laden down with English loot and plunder, and certainly payment from Ethelred, Olaf gathered his men and sailed north. On the way, he stopped off again in Normandy, and is thought to have converted to Christianity, had he not already done so prior to going to England. Thus, when Olaf returned to Norway, just like the last independent Norwegian king, Olaf Tryggvason, and unlike most of his countrymen, he was now a Christian. Upon his return in 1015, Olaf quickly declared himself king, successfully obtaining the support of the five petty kings of the Norwegian uplands, largely because of his lineage. In 1016, at the Battle of Nessiar, he succeeded in defeating his main opposition, the Earl of Laid, Swain Hakonsen, a vassal of Denmark and Sweden, and previously the de facto ruler of much of Norway. Within a few short years, Olaf had achieved the unthinkable. He had won more power than any of his predecessors on the throne. He had annihilated the petty kings of the south, subdued the aristocracy, reasserted Norwegian authority in the Orkney Islands, conducted a successful raid on Denmark, and even made peace with King Olaf of Sweden. Ultimately, however, as Canute completed his consolidation of rule in England and Denmark, he looked northwards once more to exert his influence in Norway. At the Battle of Helgea in 1026, Canute arrived in Norway with several hundred ships, bolstered by English and Danish housecarls. Though Olaf fought the invasion to a standstill, inflicting horrific casualties upon the Anglo-Danish alliance, he was eventually defeated, leaving Canute the dominant leader in Scandinavia. By 1029, Canute succeeded in fomenting a popular rebellion against Olaf amongst several of his vassals. The king was driven into exile, and Canute added Norway to his northern sea empire, with the Earl of Lade, Hakon Eriksson, his new regent. After a year or so spent amongst the Kievan Rus and the Swedes, Olaf seized the opportunity to return to restate his claim to the throne. At the ensuing battle of Stiklestad in 1030, Olaf was killed by a coalition of noblemen allied to Canute. Canute could only hold on to Norway for another five years, however, before yet another popular revolt put Olaf's son, Magnus the Good, on the throne. In a reversal of the previous Danish supremacy, Magnus succeeded in taking the throne of Denmark in 1042, after the death of Canute's son, Hartha Canute. Olaf's younger half-brother, Harald Hardrada, who had stood with him at Stiklestad, would also later return from his own exile to claim the throne of Norway in 1046, before he fatefully attempted his own conquest of England in 1066.